All right, everyone. So great you're here. This is a, a moment I've been looking forward to a long time because uh, Linda Sheehan is, is someone who came out of the world of science at MIT and then, and then went into the world of, of law. And from the very beginning of her career, she, was, she knew she had to fight for the uh, beauty of the earth. And then in that, in the, the very traditional uh, lobbying role in Sacramento, came to a realization, I'm saying this now so she doesn't have to, so she can jump into this part. <laughs> came to a realization <laughs> that the, you're gonna talk about this? Okay, <laughs> that, so Linda Sheehan is, um, Linda Sheehan is, the, the, there's a way in which, one way to interpret our, our moment is that there is a, a kind of um, earthquake taking place at the level of uh, civilization or consciousness or meaning, and then in that, in, so that, that some of us are involved with articulating what that vision that wants to come forth is, and then often the question is, well, with that with that vision, what can we do? And I think, I, in, in my personal opinion, the most uh, powerful uh, implementation of the vision that we've been developing and living in at PCC, the most powerful implementation is the development of Earth Law. It's like making the vision part of the actual way in which we regulate ourselves. So please help me in, in, in um, welcoming Linda Sheehan. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you so much, Brian. It's always such a pleasure, and I, I'm really thrilled to be here and, and talking with all of you today. And I'll talk for about half an hour or so, and then, uh, so I want to have lots and lots of time for discussion and questions and debate and challenging and all that, all that good thing. So uh, just, to, just to sort of tee off from some of what Brian was saying, um, I started uh, it was my mission, my drive to be able to do environmental work, you know, just as little tiny child. I'm old enough to be a creature of sort of Woodsy the Owl, give a hoot, don't pollute, um, keep America beautiful, you know, all of these great campaigns of the late 60s and early 70s when we started to see this real transformation of American law into the modern environmental laws that we have today. And I was, as, as, a, as a child, really energized by all of that. And I thought, like, gosh, I could, I could do that. You know, I could, you know, the, the trees and the, the creek and the area where I grew up in Massachusetts, I wanted to make sure that that was clean and healthy because when I was a child, there was still quite a bit of pre-Clean Water Act pollution. You know, you would see upstream tanneries would have accidents and it would spew all kinds of sort of brown, foul pollution. And I thought that was wrong. And so I thought, gosh, you know, these new laws, this is so exciting, I, I can do this. So, uh, but I also was really attracted to the science, uh, as Brian mentioned, of how ecosystems work. How, how do you control pollution? How do you be able to put in systems to be able to control that? And so what I did was I went to engineering um, and tried to study how to be able to do that. And went back and forth, you know, do I go work for a waste treatment company and try to control things that way or do I go to law school? And I decided to go to law school. Um, and to be able to change the law and implement the law and take all these great wonderful laws that were passed, the uh, Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and all these things that were gonna save us. Um, and try to put that into practice. So I went to law school and eventually started working in the nonprofit world. And I've been working in, this is my third nonprofit right now, um, working primarily on ocean issues and on uh, water pollution and water supply, water flows, mostly in California, but also some national and international work. Uh, right now I work for and run an organization called Earth Law Center, but we'll get to that in a minute. So. What I did basically is to start uh, in California implementing law. So some lawsuits implementing the Clean Water Act, but mostly going to Sacramento, making the drive and you know, doing a lot of work, drafting new laws, uh, drafting budget language to be able to get money to implement laws, um, trying to tighten up enforcement, working with the state water board to be able to pass uh, guidance documents that would guide the state in terms of how they implemented permits. Uh, wastewater, uh, wastewater pollution permits and putting very strict conditions on those and making the, the coast and the waters of California 
healthier and cleaner. And so I did that with some fantastic colleagues, you know, some wonderful people up and down the state that I've worked with for many years, very talented, dedicated people working hard to do the same thing that I was doing. And so along the way, we were having a number of what we'd call successes. Um, so, you know, we would pass, work to pass bond acts to bring money to clean up beach pollution. And we'd pass laws banning ships from discharging invasive species along the coast to be able to change ecosystems. And so we had all of these different things along the way. Uh, you know, California is the only state in the, in the country that implements controls on agricultural discharges in part because of the work that we did. And so we thought, wow, this is, this is good. You know, we're making a difference. And, and then, you know, the, over time when you're doing this for a really long time, you start to see that it's just this constant struggle. You're constantly getting pushed back all the time. And originally in the first couple of years, it's sort of heady. It's like, look, I can pass a law and it will get implemented and assembly members voted for it and cool. Um, but then over time, you just you see the relentless pushback of industry lobbyists, nice people, uh, but just they don't get up in the morning and they say, oh, how am I going to hurt the earth today? They say my client, you know, in the law says that I am supposed to do this, so that is what, I, uh, what I'm supposed to do. So I'm going to try to push back on these controls because it will hurt my bottom line or my client's bottom line. And so constantly fighting the, to keep the gains that we had. And over time, I would say in my experience doing this for about 20 years, it's much harder now at this day and age to pass a good environmental law than it was when I started about 20 years ago doing this. And I don't think that that's an accident at all because uh, and we'll get into why in a minute. But over this arc of time, it started to be frustrated with the pace of change. And I know it takes a while to see real change. But ultimately, it seemed to me that there was something wrong that the, at first I thought it was me, that I wasn't you know, good enough, you know, I needed to get more practice and know more people and be more connected and draft better laws with better language. But then over time you start to know people and you get experience drafting laws and you look around and you say, okay, I'm doing the, the most that I can, so what's missing? And so if it's not me and if it's not my colleagues who I think that are wonderful and talented and dedicated, then what is it? And so that's when I started to explore um, and started to read, you know, like say other, other writers. Uh, Joanna Macy was one of the first ones that I turned to and I said, wow, you know, this, this language about loving the earth, that really resonates with me. I had never thought about it that way, but that's certainly where the original work came from, you know, as a child, like children intimately know this. It kind of gets, kind of gets pushed out of them in, the, in their, their education system, unfortunately, but they know this. And I thought, wow, that's, that's exactly it. That's what I feel. So well, what do I do with that? And then I read, I don't know if you read Jack Turner um, and this wonderful book, The Abstract Wild. And he's, he's a beautiful writer, but he's very angry. Um, he expresses anger, which, you know, underneath that is fear and sadness and loss. And I said, yeah, I feel that too. That's wonderful. So what do I do with all of this? This is, you know, these crazy new understandings and philosophies. And how do I begin to reconcile this with the understanding of the way the law works, the way the law is implemented right now, and the structure of how I do my work on a daily basis and how my colleagues do their work on a daily basis. And so after, you know, perhaps I'm a slow learner, you know, but after some reflection at time and further reading and more reflection, it, it came to me, my understanding that it, it's that it wasn't it wasn't the way that I was doing the work, it was the work itself, the way the system was set up. And that was, that for me, that was a major revelation because you don't think when you're inside of it doing that type of work on a day-to-day -day basis that the way that you're doing it, the laws themselves, are trapping you, are preventing you from being able to achieve the society that you want. Uh, it's just, it's like, a, it's like a magician's trick, it's a distraction. It's a distraction from everything else that's going on. And so one of my colleagues says, you know, environmental laws, the only things that they regulate are environmentalists because they keep you in this playpen. And, you know, you can't, you can't get out to actually challenge and address and talk about these larger issues, which are how, how society operates right now. And so the understanding that, that I came to um, through all this reflection is that 
the idea that the way that the environmental laws are structured, or they assume implicitly this larger construct that, that I'm sure you all understand is that, you know, nature is treated as property. It's treated as a servant. It's treated as something that we just are allowed because we're human um, to manipulate and degrade. And the way that our environmental laws are structured is they only allow us to slow that degradation, but they don't stop it and they don't reverse it. Um, ultimately, the way, if you look at, for example, the Clean Water Act, um, one of the regulations in the Clean Water Act, which talks about what corporations are supposed to do for pollution prevention, they don't actually really have to do anything significant until there's a reasonable potential to violate water quality standards. So what that means is that until you get to the point where you're just about to really pollute the waters in a significant, very difficult to reverse way, until you get to that point, you really don't have to do anything at all. So the, the focus where you look is on the degradation. You don't look on this idea of we want healthy waterways. We don't think that, okay, we want a pristine, healthy waterway. How do we regulate our behavior to get to that? That's almost seen as a complete outlier. Um, if we have that, that's just, that's just awesome and, you know, we'll pollute that later. But it's like when you're learning to ride a bike and your dad tells you, you know, just make sure you go, you know, look where you want to go because that's where your bike is going to head. And if you look over here, that's, you're going to go off the road. Um, we don't look where we want to go with our environmental laws. We don't look at a healthy waterway or a healthy ecosystem. We look at something degraded and that's because nature is property. Nature is something that we can degrade and we should degrade. And the way that our economic system, of course, is laid out is it's built on degradation. You are rewarded on your balance sheets if you cut down a forest and you don't have to pay for the wood and you don't have to put in any pollution controls. That's a good thing. And what kind of society sets up a system like that? Uh, sort of pathological, really. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of self-reflection <coughs> that we need to be able to do in our legal system to be able to understand, well, gosh, how do we, how do, we do things differently? So when I came to this understanding, I thought like, oh my God, I don't even know where to start with this because I'm used to drafting laws. I mean, that's something that you know, I, I sort of was trained to do and, and, and take too easily. It's fun. Um, so I started to think, well, what would law look like in a system where we wanted to visualize health? We wanted to visualize something that has well-being. Um, and then I, I thought, well, gosh, I need colleagues. So I started to go to the place of all knowledge, the web, and they start Googling, you know, and then started to find people who are doing this type of work, like Cormac Cullinan in South Africa, who wrote Wild Law. And then Thomas Berry, of course, who wrote, uh, you know, a series of books addressing earth jurisprudence and this understanding that we are part of this larger whole, a very holistic sense. Again, something you understand implicitly as a little child, but that you start to lose in our very reductionist science and reductionist legal system that chops everything up into a clean air act and a clean water act and all of these other, uh, these laws that don't think of the system as a whole. So I thought, well, how do we, you know, looking at, looking at all of this literature and, and sort of reflecting and starting to talk to some of these folks, how do we create a system? How do we regulate ourselves in a way that makes sense? Because that's all law is, is it's just a way to be able to moderate our own behavior in a society, big, small, in between. Um, and so what, what people have started to talk about is using this idea of rights. And again, it, it gets bandied about this term rights and you know, there are many different ways of talking about it. But because our, our larger system is based on rights, corporate rights, human rights, the environment doesn't have any rights because it's just property. Um, just as slaves over time and, and you know, to a large extent women and children were treated as property then we also treat nature as property. And as humans, different categories of humans have, get, have gotten rights over the years, people have started to think about them differently, sociologically differently. When women got, we were talking about this earlier um, in, in breakfast, when women got the right to vote, before that, it was just, it was common knowledge, of course, that the men would take care of things and the men would vote and everything would be fine. And, and now that it was just is something unthinkable. Of course, women are part of the government system. Of course, women have a voice. But 
for that change to happen in consciousness, we needed a change in law. And we need to be able to change the perception of rights. And so that's what we're starting to talk about now in terms of the natural world is how do we start to write that in balance and think about the rights of nature, the rights of the natural world to be healthy and thrive and evolve. And that way of articulating the law can also help to guide us in what the next step is after you pass a law, you need a regulatory system to be able to implement that law. And so for me, the way I think about it and the way I present it in California as an example, is I talk about rivers. Um, and rivers, if you want to withdraw water from a river, you need to have a water right. You need to have a water right and then you can use it as a human, many human uses. But the river itself has no rights. The river has no rights to the water. So what we're seeing in California is rivers getting drained dry, literally throughout the state more and more. And obviously that makes no sense. So if you want to be able to keep the water in the river, one way to do that is to sign it rights to be able to have water for itself, for its own well-being. And a larger system associated with that would be regulations that say the river has not only a right to flow, but a right to be healthy. And that brings together all types of scientists, people who work on pollution, people who work on habitat within the rivers. You might have certain beds of grasses, certain species, certain fish. So you have different sciences that would address the watershed around the river. And you would start to bring in this sort of holistic sense of how you manage your behavior. So these larger, this larger behavioral patterns would start to change and people would start to live their lives differently in a way that was cognizant of the river's rights. So ultimately the changes in the law would start to precipitate changes in behavior. But you can't have that change in the law without the change in understanding. It, paradoxically, you have to have a certain number of people that are brought along to this awareness in order to start to change the law. Someone like me can't just go to Sacramento and say, you know, hey, I'm going to have a law for rights of rivers, and people are like, yeah, you know, I, that's okay, that's nice. Let's 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 go work on something else now and let the crazy person be by herself. Um, you start to need you need to start to build relationships and have these conversations. And I've been doing this now um, for a year or two in Sacramento, starting to have these conversations. And a, a, a colleague, um, a legislative, longtime legislative staffer in Sacramento, um, said to, I overheard him saying to a friend, you know, either I'm crazy or she's starting to make some sense. Um, and so it takes, it takes time. It takes time because it took me a while to be able to unlock the way that I think. And part of that is because we are, the way that we think is captured, again, back to the economic system, is captured by the economic system. So if things like, green economy and sustainable development um, are put out there as ways to save the environment, think about how that captures how you think because the nouns, development and economy, what's that about? That's about you know, the, uh, making the existing economic system healthier and more whole. Sustainable and green, they're just the adjectives, they're throwaways. But the real focus is on the development and on the economy. Even natural resources, I cringe every time I, I just, just, if any of you say that, please stop saying that. Because I try, all myself, I try myself all the time. Sometimes I slip because it's hard. I you know, have a dollar in a jar every time I do that. Because this idea of resources, again, reinforces this idea that we have to protect the economic system first and foremost. That, and even human resources, we talk about ourselves that way. So we need to start to unlock how we think to be able to have these conversations to open up people's awareness to these concepts so that we can pass laws, so that we can start to change the behavior of other people. It's an iterative process with everybody involved. So one way to start to do that to create an opportunity for people to think about it is to talk about, for example, sustainable communities or even better thriving communities or flourishing communities, healthy communities, where communities is defined as people and nature living together in a holistic, connected way where we are open to the health of nature as intricate, intricately and intimately connected to the health of our own well-being. So the economy in that context, if the, the noun is communities, the economy is just a tool to get us to that healthy place. And the healthy place is how we live with nature, how we live with each other, how nature lives with nature. How do we facilitate that? And so with that as our focus, rather than sustainable development, talk about thriving communities, that's an entirely different set 
of structures that we would set up to be able to implement that. But just even changing the language, you know, challenging somebody to talk about the environment without saying natural resources, may, you trip over it and you realize how caught up you are in the existing system that we have and you can't change it until you realize that. So that's one way of starting to change people's awareness, again, to be able to change the law. So when we talk about rights, it's not so much that that's definitely not the end game. The end game is to be able to change our consciousness so that we can live with each other and the natural world in a way that promotes the health and well-being of all of us together. And rights is just one way to get there. But it's an important way because it challenges people and they say, well, nature doesn't have rights. And we say, why not? Well, because, you know, we have to be able to use nature. Okay, do we have to degrade it in order to use it? Then you start to be able to have a conversation with people. So that's why people have started around the world to be able to, to, to actually write laws and pass laws that have this language, to be able to start to change how people think and how we behave. So uh, probably some of you have heard about some of these, but I'll go over a couple of examples. So Ecuador in 2008 changed its constitution in Article 71 and 72, specific in particular, but in other sections as well. They talk about the inherent rights of uh, ecosystems and species in Ecuador to exist and to thrive and evolve and to exercise their evolutionary processes. So it's not like the Endangered Species Act in the, in the United States, people say, isn't that rights of nature? It's like, no, it's the right for a species to have more than like two, you know, two entities. You know, it's just like, okay, they're not quite out yet. Okay, now they get their rights. But by that point, it's too late. You know, you've got a red, big red bullseye around them. And so what, what this is talking about is their right to be able to flourish and thrive. So we look at, for example, just off our coast, the California sea otter was down to about 30 to 40 sea otters, uh, you know, in the early part of the last century. And so scientists actually hid them when they found this pod from everybody else because they were afraid they were just going to go out. And so you would think that, you know, that's a success story, but it's still up in the air because, because they're so inbred, they're subject to a lot of disease and they're very, they're, they're very fragile the population. So is that enough to, you know, exercise their evolutionary processes like Ecuador's constitution says? We're not sure. But again, science is an important part of this conversation as well. Um, so Ecuador has this language in their constitution. I could talk more about Ecuador in a minute. Um, but also other countries have this in their laws, like Bolivia has two statutes, one passed in 2010, one passed in 2012, that talks about the law of the rights of Mother Earth. And they are trying to take this understanding of rights of nature and put it into more of a day-to-day -day application process and implementation process. So that's their initial first step in that, in that regard. And there are other legal models as well. So in um, New Zealand, there was, there's a long-standing um, a agreement that is being negotiated between the Maori iwi and the Crown government with regard to the Whanganui River and its tributaries and how it's used and how it's perceived. And in August of last year, the first step in the series of agreements recognized the legal standing of the Whanganui River and its tributaries as a legal whole, as having legal status in and of itself, which again, it was a major step forward in trying to get people who lived in along and used the river and its tributaries to be able to live in a way that recognizes that the river has its own legal standing and I need to be able to respect that. And that's just a first step in a larger process. But we're starting to see this more and more. And here in the United States, about three dozen communities have passed ordinances local laws that recognize the rights of nature. And virtually all of these have been in, in response to a particular threat that woke people up to this. So hydrofracking, groundwater extraction for bottling, um, you know, spreading of toxic sewage sludge as a fertilizer, coal mining, uh, gravel mining, things that the community didn't want and they saw as destructive to the community and said no to, but then a corporation said, you know what, it's zoned and I have the right to come in or else they would go to the state government and the state would say, you know, you don't have any authority as a municipality to pass this law, which annoyed these people enough so that they passed the law. 
um, and they include rights of nature because they realize that they need to be able to recognize the rights of nature or the corporation would just go two feet over the border and pollute over there and it would just all flow right in. They realize the connections, the holistic connections. So those laws have passed, but the most recent law that's passed is one here in California in April of this year. Santa Monica passed a new model of these types of laws and we were involved in that one as well. Um, and what the S Santa Monica Sustainability Rights Ordinance says is that um, it came from this idea that the, the community wasn't threatened by anything in particular, but they have a sustainable city plan that they wanted to protect and they were concerned after Citizens United, the U.S. Supreme Court case that gave the corporations so much additional uh, power and rights. They were concerned that that case would prevent them from being able to implement their sustainable city plan in a way that made sense, that perhaps their sustainable energy would be turned to hydrofrac gas against their will. So they passed the sustainability rights ordinance that again says that nature in the community has a right to exist and thrive and evolve. And that citizens in Santa Monica, um, like in Ecuador in their constitution and like in these other ordinances, have enforcement authority to be able to enforce against any violation of this nat the, the rights of nature to be healthy and also that citizens have a right to a healthy environment so there in Santa Monica their sustainable city plan is being updated right now and they want to pair that with this ordinance to be able to actually implement changes in how the community lives their lives so we work with them on that and we're talking with the city of Inc uh, folks who are working with the city of Vancouver um, on a similar model they have a greenest city action plan um, so this type of model I think is could be really successful in starting to pair not only this idea of nature has rights, but also how do we live our lives on a daily basis? What does a community look like? What does an economic system look like that respects the inherent rights of nature? Ecological economics gets closest. But the idea is to think from my own perspective, my own sort of engineering, practical sol problem solving perspective, is how do we get from this consciousness? How do we get from Joanna Macy and Jack Turner to this day to day, I get up, I brush my teeth, I go to work, what does all of that look like? and how do we manage our goods and services in a way that enhances our well-being, that ensures flourishing communities. Because that's really the, the end game that we want to get. The law helps us get there. The law is going to help regulate our own behavior in order to be able to achieve that. But we need to start to think about how all of these different pieces fit together. And that's why I went from the regular sort of nonprofit environmental world to start with some other colleagues, Earth Law Center, a couple of years ago, um, and to be able to start to do this work full time to envision what these <laughs> laws look like and to try to put that into practice and to work with, for example, California administrative agencies and to say, look, you know, w instead of looking and monitoring ocean degradation, Let's talk about ocean health and what does that look like and let's challenge ourselves to define what ocean health is. The pushback on science, some scientists that you get is so significant, they say, oh, that can't be done. It's like, well, you're doing a good job defining degradation. Why don't we work on the opposite? You know, it's consider it like, it's considered a challenge. We can do it together. Um, and some scientists are starting to say, yeah, this is something that we want to do and we can develop metrics and we can say this is healthy and this is how close we are and we need to change our laws to be able to push our behavior towards health. And to be able to start to implement that on a day-to-day -day basis, I think that's incredibly exciting to be able to do. And that's one of the reasons that um, I'm doing this work at Earth Law Center and others are doing very similar work all around the globe uh, to be able to enact and implement this vision that you all are talking about in all of your sessions. Um, this provision that's so important, this change in consciousness, which is really the end game, is this understanding that we are part of this larger whole and we need to live our lives accordingly. We need to live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis consistent with that. I chose to use the law to be able to get there. But there are so many other absolutely essential ways to be able to get people to recognize the connection and the responsibility they have and show them that there are ways to exercise that through changes in language, through changes in law, and through changes in economics. So with that, I'm very, very happy to entertain questions and debate and comments and Whatever, else, whatever you all want to do, I'm happy. Yes. I have two sort of um, almost logistical questions. The first one being, um, are there models within like what I would look at as 
national park legislation that can sort of help someone like you move forward in expanding protection to everything and not just like these little tiny pockets across the country. Um, but then also, what sort of practical problems would you run into, or like, what are the arguments against, say, giving a particular river along which certain communities live? Like, what would come up that would make it difficult to give it rights? Like, because I'm sure there's something, there's people who uh -huh. would have an argument. So, what sort yeah. of things come up? Um, okay. So, as to the first question, I'm not I'm not an expert on national park legislation, but what I could say is yes, you're absolutely right that we've got you know, sort of disnified parks, you know, they're, they're very disconnected and they're, they were chosen, the boundaries were chosen for various reasons, not really related to the health of ecosystems. One thing that people are working on, you know, a lot of conservationists are working on is um, migration corridors and corridors that allow for sort of ecosystems to be able to spread in a certain way. There's a World Wilderness Congress that has an advocacy program called Nature Needs Half, for example, um, to be able to say that we need more than just these little pockets. Um, certainly, like in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, um, just as one example, climate change is going to cause a significant amount of sea level rise, and we have very little tidal wetlands left, and there's such important areas for nurseries, for different species of fish, et cetera, and they're also great attenuators, so things like storm surges. So we need to start to think about letting them migrate inland. Um, and to be able to set aside land and restore land to allow that for that to happen. And that's not normally how people think. Um, so this larger national park service, but then more at the micro level, the regional level, is where we can actually, if people are interested in that type of work, that's where people are starting to do that type of work to recognize that you know this, this area of wetlands is incredibly important for its own sake and for our sake, we're connected to it. So we need to figure out a way to set aside the land. Um, and then as to the second question, it's just more about, like if you say we have a, there are very few rivers in California that are not fully, well, there's some, but most of the ones that are debated about are fully adjudicated and then some. So there are, for example, more water rights on paper and to water in the uh, San Francisco Bay Delta estuary than water exists. So about eight more times more water rights on paper because they just keep allocating them. And it's not like people use them all at once. It's not like there's a bank run on the rivers. But it could happen, and we're starting to see the water disappear as a result. So when we say, oh, the delta has a right to flow, people say, whoa, I have a right. I have a water right. You can't take my water right away. But the counter argument back is the water's going away. I mean, we have pictures, many more photographs of rivers in California that are just completely dry. And so you see people running to FEMA at that point and saying, well, you know, there's a natural disaster or something. No, you're just taking out too much water. So the water is going to disappear regardless. So we need to structure the law in a way that makes sense. So there is a process in California to be able to do that. There's lots of laws in the books that we could start to move in that direction. It's just that people say they're afraid. They don't like change. They're afraid they're going to lose the water that they kind of don't have. Yeah. Thank you so much for it. Uh, your presentation. It's just you know, clear as a bell um, and a very rapid, articulate description of the whole context that you're working in. And <clears throat> you describe uh, very well the way in which we need the laws to regulate behavior, but we need the shift in consciousness by enough people mm -hmm. to produce a climate of opinion within which changing the law is possible and um, <clears throat> and then, then then you have a recursive loop and it gets uh, strengthening as, as it now is with let's say uh, you know abolitionism and, mm -hmm. and so forth now what how I was just thinking the one example that you gave in Ecuador which of course it was the shot heard around the world we all everybody attended to that what shifted in the <clears throat> Ecuadorian collective psyche or among key individuals in Ecuador that uh, allowed them to think in terms of, of nature's rights apart from human rights. Because that's, if, in, in Santa Monica, I can kind of see, well, you know, you've got a, perhaps a kind of elite, very well-educated, mm -hmm. uh, progressive, but enough key people somehow got it through. Uh, that would be interesting <clears throat> to know more about. But what happened in Ecuador, do you know, that would have shifted it? Yeah, I mean, I was part of Santa Monica, so I know that one better. 
my understanding with Ecuador, of talking with the people who were there, is it was a mixture of things. It was you know, sort of an indigenous understanding, although the indigenous populations push back on this idea of rights and prefer to talk more about responsibilities. But that understanding of the, the holism, I think, is, is you know, from Ecuadorians, indigenous uh, populations, certainly had a role. But I think it was also more of the same reason that a lot of the other communities in the United States use this rights of nature language is because Ecuadorians felt um, concerned that multinationals were coming in and sort of laying claim to the, you know, the oil and they certainly had their, you know, their horrible experiences with oil pollution um, and all the other the minerals that exist within Ecuador. And rights of articulating rights of nature is one way actually to protect yourself um, in law from somebody coming in, corporation coming in and laying claim to that particular area. So it's partly that as well. And the, the, the problem with that is because it did not have this sort of, it was, it was negotiated more in, at the capital level, sort of top down, as opposed to coming necessarily up from the people. Not that they're necessarily opposed to it, but it wasn't something that was very actively discussed. So the problem with that is now we're seeing, you know, probably spread in the news, you know, that President Correa is uh, opening up the Yasuni um, uh, to oil drilling and that there's a, a lot of other extractive activities that are being negotiated that could destroy um, many areas, many pristine biodiverse areas in Ecuador and saying that while well, our constitution, yeah, I mean, it says that, but we can put in, you know, you know, uh, controls to make sure that the rights of nature aren't violated. So they're just kind of blowing by that. And partly you're not seeing this uprising in a mass scale because that, that groundwork you know, needs to still be laid. So it's, it's still a question. I was in Ecuador, I was in Quito a few weeks ago um, and uh, for a meeting of Amazon states, uh, the eight um, Amazon basin states. And the, uh, the folks in Ecuador had called this meeting in Bolivia also in part to be able to build support among other Amazon states for rights of nature. Uh, to be able to have some buffers, um, to be able to have some support. And, you know, the other states were not quite so supportive. Um, like Peru, Colombia, and Brazil in particular were really pushing back uh, for, you know, reasons that we can all imagine. So this, this idea of rights of nature, it's going to be, you know, so a couple steps forward, a couple steps back for a while until enough countries, too, have each other's back on this because the larger system, the larger economic system is so powerful and so global that it's just going to push back hard on this. And I think unfortunately President Correa is listening to that thinking he needs to be able to make money through these extractive activities as opposed to other ways. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, that, that's exactly my question. I loved how you said at one point something about how the economy could then serve the health of the river. You know, mm -hmm. right now we contort ourselves to serve the economy. Yes. As workers, we contort our environments, and you've talked about all the ways we've contorted our laws to serve the economy. So what I'm wondering is, as you're seeing communities make changes, are there any ways that you've seen how some other economic model or idea has, is emerging that actually does serve the health of... I mean, besides all the little pockets of, oh, this company's doing this cool thing, and they're doing this cool thing, but more systemically, how can the economy do that? Yeah, and that's a really good question, and that's something that I'm sort of trying to figure out, you know, and, and look around. I mean, there are, um, there are organizations that are trying to do that, and there's a, um, a fellow on my advisory board, um, Josh Farley, who's a professor at University of Vermont. Um, he describes what you're just saying really well, that, you know, we've got this system where it's, you know, the economy and then people and then nature, which is exactly the opposite of how reality exists, because it's the earth and then people are part of that and then we created this construct that's the economy. So that's why we're, we're seeing all this contortion, because it's, it's upside down. But in terms of actual implementation, no, I mean, what I've been seeing from what I can tell is still just these pockets of people trying out different economic models and trying out different, um, you know, uh, they call it generative economies now. Um, it, it, but I have not yet seen like an entire community that is trying to live this way. I think Santa Monica is trying to get in that direction. But I think it's really hard for people to envision, you know, what that might look like and to be able to live within this larger construct of the larger economy that we live in. Um, I was just in a, a retreat last week to talk about this very issue is like how do we create economic models that are consistent with rights of nature and how can rights of nature help in turn facilitate these new economic models and it's still really in its infancy it's it's but there's a lot of energy behind that very effort and so it's something that you know I particularly want to focus on more but I haven't seen it particularly yet but we're trying yeah and then he and then yeah, yeah. Um, 
I'm wondering if you've seen any um, sort of confluence between the movement or concept of restorative justice and environmental ethics in, in your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly the, the restorative justice has come up um, quite a bit because um, some of the folks who are working on um, this particular issue um, have had experience with that. So like Cormac Cullinan, um, who wrote the book Wild Law, was a student during the, the uh, apartheid uh, uprising, you know, the, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa I was one of those people up there, you know, and the, you know, trying to get people into action and hiding from the police and that kind of thing. Um, and so he's, you know, familiar with the, the restorative justice work that was done in South Africa and thinks that and writes about how, you know, I think this is a great way to be able to start to heal some of these uh, fissures that we've created, some of these great enormous cracks actually between us and the environment because it's not people say, well, gosh, you know, we've created basically a, a, a human-centered earth now. We've got our footprint everywhere. How do we even begin to undo that? Um, but we've done that in the past with, with slavery and with how we treat women, et cetera. So we can start to think about you know, how to make amends with the earth in a way that starts to be able to heal certain places. And that might get back to your earlier question about setting aside land and restoring land and be able to set aside migratory corridors and important you know, ecosystem places where we are saying that you know, through science, we're, under, we're gonna use science for positive, for good, to be able to understand how we can best protect the earth. And some of these land areas, maybe we're just gonna let go and, and be able to restore in a way that protects the earth and that will be part of our amends. And you know, we're gonna be able to make that a priority for our community or for our state. So yeah, definitely people are talking about that. Polly Higgins talks about that through her ecocide work as well. Talks about restorative justice quite a bit and has a whole, if you look at our website, has a whole big section on that. Yeah. Thank you, that was just fabulous. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I'm wondering, uh, going from the uh, local initiatives that need to happen, regional, bi-regional, and so on, uh, but building with this notion of community, from this notion of community, with the understanding that there are no absolute boundaries between communities, especially with climate change, we see this, but uh, how the idea of the commons, the global commons is being used, or is it, uh, is it um, appealed to at all? Is there a rethinking mm -hmm. of the commons in terms of basically um, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and, and uh, the species that um, uh, we're, we're part of? So there's a link between the Earth community and the global commons. I'm just wondering if the commons is, mm -hmm. is part of the conversation. Yeah, there are a lot of people talking about uh, the commons right now as a way, especially um, I work with a lot of water activists, my experience is in water, and so I've worked with a lot of the human right to water activists at the UN level to try to you know, introduce some of these rights of waterways language um, to, to their lexicon and you know, bring some of their language to mine. So you know, to be able to build those connections. And of course, in the water area, the commons comes up quite a lot. Um, from the, the, the earth law perspective, the, the way that the commons is structured, the understanding about how we're part of a whole, I mean, that certainly resonates significantly from the earth law perspective. The way, the way that I think that sometimes it can be used is that parts from it a little bit is this idea that uh, the next idea is sort of the public trust doctrine where, you know, we are stewards, we humans are stewards of the commons. It's still very kind of top down. So we're understanding the commons as a, as a holistic thing. But then at the same time to be able to say, you know, we're going to stand over and protect, um, it loses some of that holism. Um, to be able to have more, I think it, it's, it, it lacks a, a, some of the essential humility that, that comes with this idea of, of earth law, at least the way that, that I understand it, um, to be able to say, you know, we're, we're not even that important, really. You know, we're just part of this larger whole, and we should be, you know, just first, first off, extraordinarily grateful for that. And to figure out how we can exercise our responsibilities as part of that whole without thinking that, you know, we're stewards. Uh, we have responsibilities, but not because we're sort of above. It comes with this understanding of 
people are having a hard time letting go, uh, some people of, of humans as exceptional. Human exceptionalism is a real barrier, I think, to this idea of, of earth law and trying to change our behavior, and we need to let go of that a little bit. And so sometimes the, the commons movement has trouble letting go of that. Sometimes it doesn't. It just depends on who's doing it and who you're talking to. I don't know if that answers the question. No, it does. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, that we can carry on this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and then you, and then you. Um, I, you kind of touched on this a little bit, and I uh, just want to ask a more specific question about looking at the models of transition of the abolition of slavery and women introduced into the workforce and kind of um, the idea of invisible economies, like things that aren't recognized by the economy, then beginning to participate in the economy in a, a measurable way. That there was work being done there, but it wasn't accounted for economically. Mm -hmm. um, and. So, so something of a liberation of new economic producers. And so then if we think of land as is, is this, like how does that start to participate in the economy in a new way with its own rights and how do we steward that? And I was just wondering if you um, work with the idea of land use tax. Are you mm -hmm. familiar? Well, I mean, I'm familiar with taxation systems, generally carbon taxes and things like that. Are you talking about something like uh, that? I, I guess I heard, have heard of it in the context of, um, and, and I don't know the specifics of it, it's kind of just in conversation that I've discussed, but such that if you're taking something from the land, then you're paying a tax to, you know, the larger organizing system of mm -hmm. that, you know, if you're extracting resources, whereas if you're allowing the land to do its thing or improving it, you're, then it's free, yeah. basically. Um, well, I think that so that. Paying a tax on the degradation. Oh, I'll, I'll I'll use my lawyer answer and say it depends. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I think it, it depends on where you're coming from with that particular uh, tool. I mean, it's a tool to be able to regulate our behavior, just like anything else. And if you're coming, you could easily be coming from like we're doing it in the modern day. We could easily be coming from this sort of idea that like our environmental laws accept implicitly, without question, not even thinking that of course this current neoliberal economic model within which we live is the right one and th that has always been the model within which we lived and it always will be um, and so it's not even qu it's not even questioned and so things like you know carbon taxes perhaps some land use taxes payment for ecosystem services you know fish catch shares you know that they use off the coast all of these different things are market tools to be able to minimize or reduce the impacts of this larger economic system but ultimately facilitate its continued use because it makes you think like you're doing something when you're really not. Um, so if you're, if you're coming at it from that perspective, then it won't help. But if you're coming from it from the perspective where you're trying to envision a, a, you know, an ecological economic model, like the type that Josh Farley writes about, um, where you're recognizing your place within the larger system and you're respecting the land and that you know that whatever, it's a sort of a, what they call cradle to cradle system, whatever you take from the land, you have to put back in a way that's respectful and it's not going to sort of last in terms of impact. Then, you know, if, that, if the tax is a way to do that, then that's great. It just depends on where, the, where you're coming from with that. So it, it sort of really just depends, sorry. Um, you were at name. Um, as we as we heard from the presentation, which was extremely clear and beautiful, um, that um, the work of Joanna Macy was significant for you to mm -hmm. make your own tra transition um, of consciousness. And I'm curious what, um, and I, I hope that's not too personal. What aspect in you allowed you to receive Joanna Macy's words? No. Oh. And why why do you think does it not reach some other people? And what what does it take in your mind for the story to reach as many people as possible? Oh, that's a really, thank you for that question. That's a really good question because we struggle with that. The, those few of us who do this work really, you know, struggle with that. It's like, how, how did we come to that and how, how do we express that to other people or, or create a space to allow other people to accept that? And I, you know, I can't, I, I wish I could say exactly you know, why I was in that particular space at the time, but I was, 
I was searching for something. If you've seen the movie The Matrix, you know, it's like it was like a splinter in my brain. Um, I just couldn't quite put my finger on what it was that was really troubling me about the work that I was doing because I'd been doing this lobbying work and this work in California implementing laws for years and years and it just felt like I was banging my head against the wall. So uh, I don't know who recommended Joanna Macy or how I got on to that but when I read the book it was just like oh that's the words those are the words we're talking about loving the earth you know as yourself. I didn't have the words for it so when I saw the words I was like oh that's it then you can start to open up. Um, and so I think what we might be able to do is to put those words, I mean, I consider part of my responsibility to put those words out there. Um, you know, Joanna's words, my words, whatever they might be, to be, so that other people who are similarly concerned, and I see it, you know, when I, when I talk to students and, and just people, it, it resonates when you sort of talk like this because they go, yeah, yeah, it, it, something resonates with them too. Um, and so I think that it's just the way that the society is structured, you don't really think about that. You just think about your day-to-day -day utilitarian, you know, how do you accomplish your life, but you don't talk about love. Um, and so I think that, you know, maybe that's what we just do. We just start talking about love and people say, oh, yeah, all right, that makes sense. So for me, I was just, I just had this sort of pent-up demand for love. So, it, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. It's a great presentation. Um, like Rick, I'm I'm also interested in um, what in the collective psyche um, facilitates the opening for change. And, and we were talking at breakfast because I was also interested in what had happened in South America, and Bolivia, and Ecuador in particular um, that might elicit that. And I had a sense when we were talking that it was definitely um, a kind of an affiliation and openness to indigenous ways. And of course, when you talk about um, New Zealand, and Erica brought in the restorative justice, I know a little bit about the restorative justice movement in New Zealand, especially around narrative therapy, which developed there age, years and years ago with the Maori people. And so once again, there's this openness, this predilection to be open to indigenous wisdom, which then, of course, connects back into Thomas's fourfold way of wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just wonder for us, certainly on this continent, whether or not that might present an opportunity for us to ask for help to embrace indigenous cultures in a way that's deeply honoring and respectful. Um, I just think something in the milieu, you know, there, there are tendrils that connect all of these, these three, the, these countries in particular, Bolivia, Ecuador, and New Zealand. And my sense is it's one of those big things is this openness to indigenous ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what you think about that. Well, I, I certainly do think that we have so much to learn from indigenous wisdom and that the more we're exposed to that, the more we start to remember how we used to live in a way that is cognizant of our place within this larger whole. So I think that it is important that people start to awaken to things that they already recall. This is nothing, you know, I talk about earth law and that's nothing new. I mean, it's just, law is just how we regulate ourselves. It doesn't have to be Western law written in a book. It, it could be the, how we operate within a small indigenous community, for example. Um, but I do think also that, you know, just, just to add on top of that, I do think that we tend to underestimate or underutilize or underreach out to uh, sort of more traditional, uh, not traditional, but um, other faiths. So we were just talking earlier about, you know, a number of the folks who, who do this work were raised Catholic, um, a very significant percentage actually, and wondering why that is. I've had that conversation with some other folks. And so to think that, you know, a lot of, a lot of these, um, these movements that have happened, these rights-based movements, you know, the abolition and women's rights, et cetera, came up out of church communities too. And so I think that, again, you know, that, that sort of, a, a, that sort of, um, it, the, church, the church system allow it has its, you know significant issues with the rules and all the you know the, the the other issues that kind of prevent you from having that connection. But they also allow you to have a connection in a way that resonates with people. This idea of love and this idea of reaching out. And so it's not it doesn't bring that natural sort of indigenous wisdom that we need to get to. But it it could certainly be a, a great way to start to engage more people in this movement through churches, through expression of faith, through expression of spirituality in the way that people understand it and respect for that spirituality. 
and to try to see how we can engage in that conversation in a broader way with more people from where they are and not necessarily where we want them to be and respecting where they are. I actually wanted to add that um, I realize not everyone knows what restorative justice is, and it's, there are a lot of principles around it, and it's highly contested what it is, but um, it's sort of a victim-centered approach, whereas retributive justice, which we're all quite familiar with, focuses on the perpetrator and what they did and punishing them for violating the law. Restorative justice is more, what are the victim's needs here? What, how can we form a relationship between the perpetrator and the victim? and bring healing in a more holistic way rather than this contract between the offender and the state. So it's taking that intermediary out in, in a certain way and trying to bring um, victims and offenders together. So if the victim is the environment, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And to just get up and say, I'm sorry. And, and how can I make amends? And then really deeply understanding how you can make amends. And then you'll figure out a way. Yeah. Well, let's um, have one more question. Uh, <laughs> let's have two more questions. Okay. And then, good. Robert will be the last. Okay, I was just going to ask uh, what specific amends you felt California could make. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just reading this article yesterday about how it will take thousands of years for the impacts of gold mining in California to, you know, become at an equilibrium point again. And, you know, I mean, when you see the, the old, you know, um, uh, prints of people just with the, you know, the hoses just blowing out the mountains and, you know, everything that goes with the gold and the mercury and, you know, all of that just washing in the rivers and thinking about the legacy of that, you know, I, I would certainly think like, you know, how do we make amends for that? You know, how do we start to restore waterways to their health? And putting, just putting water back in waterways. I mean, the, the, the way that they wrote about salmon, just, you know, 150 years ago, they said it swam so thickly, it looked like you could walk across their backs to cross the river. Um, so just to start to make amends by just, I mean, I'm a water person, you know, I just find it, you know, incredibly grounding. So to be able to say, let's, let's look at waterways, let's make them clean and healthy. Um, and then everything just kind of follows from that. So certainly there's so much there. It'll be a long session in the uh, confessional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. The answer to the question and uh, complicated and we're over time. I no, can no, have five no, 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 no. All right. So, um, <laughs> I'll answer quickly. It depends. It's, it's, it's probably the Catholic <laughs> thing to set me off. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, um, please. You know, so um, one of the reasons that I think I and probably everybody here is inspired is to see you go deeper than law to love and, and from minimalism to health. It's wonderful to hear you and to appreciate your work. Uh, and so I sort of apologize for going back to minimalism mm -hmm. and what I'm thinking about is a certain says pre-law and I'm many times during your talk I was thinking about what I've learned about uh, peace and war and how the the non-violent uh, campaigns seem to be most effective when there's uh, the threat of something worse mm -hmm. so I'm wondering in your work uh, when you trying to get a law passed or get people to pay attention to the need for the law, whether or, or the extent to which the threat of worse could lead to uh, a more receptive response mm -hmm. to law because it, this law is not what we want, but it's so much better than what could happen. Yeah. Is that happening and is that... Well, yeah, yeah, and I can answer that briefly. Um, I mean, one example of exactly where that happens is this work that's being done to pass these local ordinances because the organization, there's one organization that does quite a bit of work doing this and their firm belief is that people won't respond until they have a threat in their face, um, like fracking or mining. We're seeing fracking um, all, all over the place where pe communities are rising up. Right. And so they're responding with law that recognizes the rights of nature. Um, I personally think that it needs to go much bigger than deeper than that because I think that that sort of immediate like don't hurt me reaction is not the same as I love I'm part of the whole it's different 
It's, and so I think that Santa Monica is trying for that. I mean, it's, you know, they recognize that there's a ways to go there as well. But that's why we need this sort of larger, you know, movement that's not just law, but all of these other elements as well to be able to start to change this larger consciousness. But in the case of the environment, my worry is that in the larger way, like with water, for example, in California, if we get to the point where, you know, it's like, oh my God, we're about to run out of water. I think that's too late for a law. I, I personally am really concerned that that might be too late, having seen how water works in California. My worry is that at that point, everybody's just going to be grabbing. Um, and water is not the kind of thing that you want to prevent other people from having. So the idea would be to maybe sort of start, to start this movement now, and, and we can see that, that, uh, that path in front of us to maybe get people to start to change. That's what I'm trying to do anyway, because I'm really worried that that... It's going to fork, and we're going to go down the wrong fork. So. Isn't it, isn't it cool that Linda's not a corporate lawyer? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is my standing ovation. <laughs> Great treat.